This is a tour. We're going to go around the block, really just around the block. And uh, the, the hardest part of the walking is going to be coming up um, Oakland Ave because that's a pretty steep hill. Um, right at the end. It's sort of like the marathon, you know, Heartbreak Hill, and then <laughs> here we are. Um, and um, this is officially the first time I've done this tour, uh, hence the voluminous notes which I'll be referring to. Um, we've done bits and pieces of it over the years for the Historical Society, but this is the first time it's all together. So it's an interesting tour because there's very little aims Hallelujah. And um, there's uh, a, a lot more of the people who made the money for them and also made the village. So we're kind of going to be focusing on the area between um, 1850 and 1900, although we're going to start here and talk a little bit about the, the school buildings because they're pretty cool and I do know a little bit about them. Now. I, I know some of you live in the neighborhood or have lived in the neighborhood. If you know something that I don't, please jump in. Okay. Millions of people will see you because you're going to be on ECAT, but still, <laughs> that'll, that'll get them, see? All right. Uh, but jump, jump in anyway, because we want to add as much information to these tours as we go along. Uh, I'm sure somebody will be carrying these on someday um, after I'm gone. So. Um, Let's get started. We're going to walk over to the parking lot of the uh, of the apartment building. Okay. I'll speak up as loud as I can. I'm on mic here, so um, if you can't hear me now, watch it on television. So um, I just before I came up here was reading a newspaper article from 1864, which I had somehow managed to miss. It was in my collection and there it was. And it was descri describing Northeastern Village as a thriving community, uh, which indeed it was in 1864 because there was a gigantic demand for shovels brought on by the Civil War. Um, the number of workers in the shovel shops went from about 72 in uh, 1855 to over 300, almost 400, by um, 1865. So uh, it was huge, and the, uh, the value of product uh, increased fivefold. Uh, Northeastern was on, a, uh, a, on the verge of a, of a big breakthrough because over the next few years, the railroad would be extended from essentially where the Railroad Station Museum is today all the way down to Taunton. It hadn't gone that far before, and that will impact what we see on the tour today. Uh, and in 1869, uh, pretty much in where your parking lot is here today, uh, a, uh, a building was built, the very first Easton High School. And um, uh, it changed the complexion of the, uh, of the village because it had a tower with a clock. And so you could climb up to the top and look at how appallingly ugly Northeastern really was. It <laughs> might have been thriving, but it wasn't pretty. Uh, the newspaper article says there are a few good-looking houses in, in the village. Uh, but for the most part, there were dirt roads, and the dirt roads were eroded, and it wasn't pretty. So when people got to the top up there, they said, oh, my God, we should fix up this place. And that's the start of Olmstead and Richardson and the Ames of spending money. We're not going to be talking much about that today. But uh, we are going to be talking about Governor Ames, uh, who in 1895 donated the money to build the, f the first part of this building, the, the tall part. Uh, and he wanted it to be named Easton High School, okay, not Northeastern High School. Uh, and uh, unfortunately for him, uh, he shuffled off, he died, he uh, had been having heart trouble for a number of years. Uh, and his doctor, Dr. Cogswell, um, couldn't do anything for him. Um, the most spectacular thing is while he was governor, he was in a parade in New York and fell off his horse because he was having chest pains. Uh, and so he passed away while this building was being built. And the school committee voted unanimously to call it Oliver Ames High School. Subsequently, people discovered that, you know, we farm boys from the rest of the, of the town really got a benefit from going to Oliver Ames because everybody thought we went to a private school. <laughs> okay. So um, 
the building of the high school was sort of in the tradition of the Ames family. One of the key tenants of the Ameses, unlike some of the other um, big businessmen of the era that had company towns, was they promoted the right to rise, which is something that President Lincoln talked about a lot. You know, give everybody a chance to better themselves and the country will grow. So they believed it here in Easton that, well, the, the old man probably says, yeah, you know, everybody should be like me and I had a good education and I go to church. So I'm going to pay for schools and I'm going to pay for churches. And that's what the Ames family did for um, everybody. In Northeastern in 1864, there were already four churches and another one on the way. So there were a lot of churches mostly funded. Schools mostly funded by the Ameses, including that original building. But this building got the name Oliver Ames. And luckily for us, there was a widow, Anna C. Ames, Anna C. Ames is one of the more neglected people in Easton's history. She should be much more famous than she is, but she's the villain in the Blanche Ames uh, video because, oh, gee, she was not cool like Blanche. Huh? <laughs> Nobody was cool like Blanche, let me tell you. But uh, Anna was pretty cool for being a Victorian lady because she was a suffragist, just like her daughter-in-law. And she was a suffragist before Blanche uh, even got to Easton. As a matter of fact, Anna was on the literature committee of the women's suffrage organization that sent literature to Blanche's college while she was in college. Uh, so she was a big promoter of women's rights. And in 1902, she decided to take a step forward uh, and um, build on her husband's contribution. And in 1902, she built this building here right pretty much where we're standing. Not the two uh, wings that bulge out on the side, but the little building in the middle. And that became the Anna C. Ames Gymnasium. It was the gymnasium for the high school, but it was also the gymnasium for the town. So there were, it was almost like a YMCA. Uh, so you could go over there um, unrelated to school and, and, and work out. There were boys days and girls days. but. There were boys days and girls days. Whenever there was a program for boys, there was always a program for girls, okay? So um, the first thing she did was hire a guy named Harry Pratt, who uh, was uh, a all-star quarterback at uh, Brown University. He was a Walter Camp All-American honorable mention uh, in those days, and she was able to get him. She also hired a person named uh, Rose Scanlon, who had been trained at uh, the Sargent School, which is now Northeastern University. But um, in those days, it was noted for its phys, phys ed program. And they both came here uh, in 1902. And by 1910, the boys won their first state championship in basketball. And three years later, the girls won their first championship in, uh, in basketball. They had more of a struggle, however, uh, because many people believed basketball was too strenuous for girls. And sadly, people believe that. Now, in Anna C. Ames's day, the girls played boys' rules. So they ran up and down the court like real basketball players. Sometimes there might be seven people on the court because they didn't have that five person team thing, but uh, the thundering horde would run back and forth. All right. So Anna, to prove to her friends that this was fine, brought doctors to Northeastern along with her Boston friends to watch a basketball game. And then all the girls were given heart exams after the game was over to prove that they were just as healthy as the boys. Um, um, the next step that Anna took was to support the music program and when this building wasn't being used for a gymnasium the back part was the music room for the high school. Anna paid for all the musical instruments and she paid for instructors to come from the Boston Symphony. Okay, I don't know if boys and girls were in there, I've never seen a picture of the of the boys marching bands or the, the marching bands that had girls in it. They may have had their heads under the, the helmets, but I don't know if that was a, a dual sport. But she got payback anyway, because if you were a really good player, you got to play in the Anna C. Ames band. And if you were a boy, the Anna C. Ames band played in women's suffrage parades. So you were automatically supporting <laughs> women's suffrage. 
okay? When Anna died in 1917, the entire athletic program was on the verge of collapse because she paid for the whole thing. Her son, Oak Ames, Blanche's um, husband, that's as we call him today, uh, picked up the program for two years, particularly the basketball program. But um, it was a lot of money uh, and um, uh, it looked like sports were going to phase out of, of OA. But in 1920, Mary Frothingham, the woman who opposed women's suffrage back in the day, uh, and her husband, Louis Frothingham, bought the building as the headquarters for the American Legion. Frothingham was a, a founder of the Legion. So what they did over the next few years was add the two wings that we're used to here. Uh, they put in a locker room for the boys, um, and um, uh, they added to the music rooms over, over here. That's where the Legion met in this area here. Uh, and then uh, ultimately around 1930, uh, again, the town was struggling with the depression coming to uh, pay for the sports program. So they dumped this, uh, they uh, sold this building to the Frothingham Corporation after Louis's death. And it stayed in the Frothingham uh, Corporation the park uh, for many, many years, and then lately was sold to the town, and that's why you guys get to use it. Um, over here in 1930, despite the fact that the Depression was on, and sort of as a way of fighting the Depression, the town decided to put an addition on this building. And um, you can see the difference in the size of the bricks. The bricks are gold because maybe there were some leftover bricks uh, from the state house, because when the governor was the governor, he built the addition to the state house uh, that's still there today out of these gold bricks. Carl Freemer was the architect. They'd known each other for half a century. Um, and uh, the new addition had to be made out of gold bricks. And then when Doug King took it over and had to repair it to put the apartments in, we made him put gold bricks in, which just drove him nuts because nobody makes gold bricks anymore. So he had to look all over the country to find them. Uh, but uh, ultimately what happened is this was the new classroom addition. The building that was here from 1869 was condemned. Um, it had served as the kindergarten and then, the, and then junior high together. Uh, and. Uh, Everybody moved over there, high school to junior high, and this wonderful new gymnasium was built, which now is being turned into more apartments. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Y had um, uh, a gymnastics program there for a while, and unfortunately, because COVID came along, uh, it wasn't a sustainable program at that point, and then, you know, they had to get rid of it. And a little bit of news. Um, announced this week is that the YMCA has a memorandum of agreement, a mem excuse me, a memorandum of understanding, which is not an agreement. That's not a, we're going to buy the place. But if what they're saying is if they do buy the old center school to put in a new YMCA, yeah. it, may, it may be down there. And for us that are lions, the happy news is in the memorandum of understanding, they're going to keep the rink. Okay. So you can skate down there so, in, the, in the summertime. All right, enough contemporary stuff. We're going to walk in this direction now, and uh, we'll get into the story of how this neighborhood was really important um, for the success of, of the shovel works. Because why stay here if you know, you're going to have a, a lifetime of really difficult labor? Working in the shovel works was a hard job. Um, but if you planned, you could be successful. So let's get down here. You know, that basketball rule, that lasted in, until the 60s. Yeah, it was terrible. I remember as a as a junior high kid watching the girls play with the you know the the zones, which is ridiculous, absolutely you ridiculous. Go past half court. I know it was terrible. Dribble three times and pass. Yep. All right. Thundering horde is coming. Here we go. I did, I think, shower this morning. So if you want to get a little closer, and we could we could help out by blocking the camera, that would be good. So. So here we are at the corner, and um, 
Lincoln Street was really, really interesting for a long time. That side was mostly, and unfortunately the ones I'm going to point out to you aren't, but mostly Ames tenements. Because by the time that we get to the 1860s, um, private rooming houses and people who are willing to put up shovel workers just weren't enough. So the Ameses began to buy up buildings and move them in, in many instances uh, over here onto Lincoln Street and over onto Pond Street. And those became Ames tenements. This side of the street, however, was homeowners. Basically what happened was um, we ran out of Yankees to fill up the shovel works and uh, as the boys said, if first best wasn't available, second best had to do, and they brought in the Irish. <laughs> That's how they explained it to Dad, who was not a fan of the Irish, because they were Irishmen were different. You know, they were Catholics, and and as members of the family pointed out, their religious service were mumbo jumbo because the priest did the mass in Latin in those days. Anyway. Um, they came here and there were three kinds of Irishmen. There were transient young folks that came here, found out that there were a lot of hostility here in Easton to, um, to Irish. Uh, this was the time of the Know Nothing scandal where uh, the state of Massachusetts for three or four years was taken over by people who were anti-immigrant. Um, and, um, you know, they passed laws that basically said, hey, you know, it takes you 21 years to become a voter. We're going to make the same rule for Irishmen. They have to be here 21 years, blah, 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 blah. And that lasted for a few years. And um, unlike, unlike the awful people today, um, at least the know-nothings liked black people. And they were number one in the abolitionist, uh, abolitionist camp, promoting uh, uh, the Underground Railroad and a whole bunch of wonderful things. They just hated Irishmen. Ah. But a ton of Irishmen came here and uh, the young ones moved on very quickly. It was a tough town uh, if you were Irish, partly because of this man over here. Now this is the 1860-ish house of Joseph Barrows, who was the Justice of the Peace. Okay, The law and order of the town, and he was also an employee of the shovel company. Yeah. Uh, usually I'm pretty good with the, the Ameses being pro-worker. This was one example here, however, where justice was in the pocket of the Ames family. And the one thing they wouldn't stand for was uh, violation of temperance. The know-nothings were big into temperance and actually made Massachusetts a dry state for a couple of years, sort of, well, officially dry. Um, the message didn't get to the Irish population of the town. <laughs> but I do have to say that um, it wasn't their fault. They bought the liquor. It was old Yankees who were bringing the booze in. And so it was Barrow's job to enforce the crackdown. And uh, if you're looking at diaries from the 1850s, uh, there were a, a number of crackdowns where people who were running secret saloons would be busted and brought in and you know, either fined or actually even sentenced um, for a time. Barrows, uh, however, was here for a long, long time and ultimately built this beautiful house. Um, we don't know whether this was here in one of the pretty houses mentioned in the 1864 article, but it's one of our really few Greek Revival houses here in Northeastern. I can tell it's Greek Revival because it has columns on it. Uh, and um, uh, it also has some uh, really cool decorations. If you look up above the shingles and the little black row of little teeth, they're called dentils, but basically that's Latin for teeth. Uh, and a beautiful Italian window here. This is a gorgeous house, and the current owners have kept up the idea of multicolored Victorian painting, so it makes it a particularly special. Right across the street, however, was the good news. Many of the early workers in the shovel company came here, particularly the earliest workers, and they uh, were uh, intent upon staying here and building a house. This fella here was uh, a guy named Higginbottom. 
He was English, he wasn't Irish, uh, and he was also a, a skilled worker. So he was a machinist and a stationary engineer. Does everybody know what a stationary engineer is? Okay, well, you know, an engineer is a guy that drives a locomotive. If the locomotive didn't move, it was stationary. And the very first steam engines at the shovel works were just the same kind of steam engines that ran trains. So you brought in a stationary engineer. He was a stationary engineer. Remember that name Higginbottom, because one of the things that happens as this neighborhood develops is everybody marries everybody else. So uh, there's a lot going on. Across the street, we have some genuine Irishmen. And um, uh, I said there's three kinds, the ones that move through, the ones that stayed in tenement housing their entire life, and then like their children and grandchildren who are still here in, in Easton got the houses and stuff. And then there were the early Irishmen like um, David Middleton and William Hayes and Henry McArdle. Those are the three earliest Irishmen we know from the diaspora uh, who came here and as quickly as possible, within about a decade of working at the shovel works, they had saved up enough money to buy a house. And one of those houses was up here, uh, which is 15 um, Lincoln Street. That's the greenhouse there. And sadly, that house was, according to the Mass Historical Commission, ruined um, about 20 years ago when a second story was added to the cottage. So if, you're, if you look at the houses on either side of it, that's what it originally looked like. Now, how did you pay for a house like that? Well, you took in boarders. Uh, a typical family of the day, whether it was Irish or Yankee, had multiple children. So there were five or six kids and then three or four boarders uh, that lived in this basically cottage-sized house. Uh, and that's how they paid for it. A little further up the street, the White House, uh, which is 21, uh, belonged to an Irish widow lady, uh, McCarthy. And that's the foundation of the McCarthy family in town. The widow lady had a son, John, who at age 13 started a livery business down um, next to um, uh, Bill's Pizza. And uh, that turned into the first oil company, et cetera, et cetera. And it ultimately became uh, the um, McCarthy Transportation Company. And if you guys remember Alice and, and Charlie McCarthy, that's that family. Okay, now she had boarders. She came here as a widow lady and then um, uh, ultimately got married after 13 years of being a widow. And then the second husband died and she just kept on going with this, this uh, boarding of uh, dozens of people over the years. And that house was always a big house, smart lady. Uh, and um, so it probably wasn't crowded when it had 13 or 14 people in it. I wouldn't want to live there, but um, there it is. And think of cooking. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the landlady, and in a boarding house, you made the meals. So meals for over 10 people every day, all the time. So she earned her money and established a dynasty. Um, and let me get you, I should give you the real name here. Uh, she did have a real name. Julia. I knew it was a J. So that's Julia McCarthy. Uh, to me, she's a real hero. Over here is what's known as the Honeymoon Cottage. And um, it uh, actually, once upon a time, when it was first built at some unknown time, probably the 1830s. What does the sign say over there? It says 1850, probably. That's the official day. It's probably earlier than that because this house was originally down between where the library and the hall is. And uh, it was privately owned by the Ames family, okay? Um, what that meant that it was a special kind of tenement. It was a place that instead of housing the usual shovel workers, was housing people who worked on the estates, okay? or people who were special. Um, Dr. Stevenson, so some of you may vaguely remember Dr. Stevenson. He was around in, into the 1930s and 40s. Not that you guys remember that, but you might have heard something from your parents, okay, or even grandparents about Dr. Stevenson because he was here for a long time um, and um, ultimately moved into that house. 
So why is it called the honeymoon cottage? Because when it was down below, it was what the family used when somebody got married and they were building a house. The only smart one in the family was Oaks Angerames, who built Cuisset House before he got married. He was apparently, he knew he was engaged and ready to go. Uh, whereas uh, the governor, the future governor, um, got married to Anna, brought her from Nantucket, and then said, oh yeah, well, we don't have a house. So um, they moved into the honeymoon cottage and they stayed there at least a year while the mansion that um, is on the site of the house that two days ago was still there uh, at the Governor Ames Estate. Uh, that house is from the 1950s and you know, take a quick look at it because it's gonna be going in the next month or so. Um, we're gonna have a fabulous pavilion there with mahogany tent poles. It'll be great, it really is gonna look good. Um, so um, it was used at least one more time because uh, Ann, um, um, the governor's sister uh, got married to a guy named Fox, uh, who looked like the typical, how can I say it? Did I say Fox French? Uh, who looked like the typical, hey, here's a rich girl, and I don't have really a lot of prospects, so I'm gonna work my hardest to, uh, to hook up, and he, he did. Um, he was terrified of his father-in-law, which, uh, but there's a there's a funny story that uh, he was having uh, he was having breakfast with the family and um, had a little bit of a cold. So Evelina, um, Oaks Ames's wife, offered him a little bit of rum in his coffee because she used the rum to make um, mince mince meat. Well, Oaks was a determined temperance person. He really was serious about it. And he said, no one in my house will ever drink, blah, 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 yell, yell, yell. And then he went off to work. And the response from Evelina was, so, do you want a drink? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mr. French was too scared to take the drink. And that's how he out, out won the fair lady, apparently. So they lived there for a while. And then uh, uh, as, Anna, uh, as Evelina got older, they moved back with her. All right, we're going to go down the hill. This is the downhill part of the course, so, you know. Which house? Yes. So, I have to speak up for him um, because the house is really in terrible condition. We noticed that. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is that uh, ginormous medical expenses. One of the daughters has an incredibly rare disease that's costing them a bundle of money. So. Um, yeah, give them a break. Okay. Excuse me, what did you say about Nantucket, about this house? What did you say about Nantucket? Once there was a man made from Nantucket. <laughs> <laughs> and it was basically Anna Coffin Ray Ames. And, and there's a strange connection between Easton and Nantucket. We don't know what it is. Um, no, it wasn't moved. No, they moved them from long distances, but not that long. Okay. All right. All right, we're getting out of the street so we don't kill anybody. So just a... Yes, question. No, we're not going to go that far. Jeez, this is a council and aging walk. They told me keep it short. No, we're not going to go down there, but... Uh, um, Someday that will be taken care of. The problem, it's a, it's a problem building, as you know. It's, it's ugly and there's no real excuse for that anymore. But um, um, it's a complicated lot. There's three houses on the lot and the lot has to be subdivided in order to do anything with it. And then um, we tricked ourselves, thanks to me uh, and some, several other people, when we created a um, local historic district. And it, and what that means is that if you want to change a house in a local historic district, there's a process you have to go through, and the idea is to preserve the look of a place, which we're doing a fine job of right now. That's looked that way for a long time. Uh, but uh, uh, what it means is that the smart thing to do with that building would be to demolish it. But in, in order to demolish it, it has to be rebuilt in a similar style. So right now, as far as I know, and I'm not really up to date on this anymore, um, uh, either um, um, 
Dave Howe owns the property or has an option on it, and just at the right time they're going to they're going to do something about it. Um, but you know, we in Southeastern think it's it's wonderful that Northeastern has a little black eye right in the middle of it. So. <laughs> Just, just for laughs, uh, <laughs> and we're getting a new police station and a new fire station, uh -huh. Southeastern. Yeah, uh, I won't gloat much. That's if you guys vote the money to do it. Uh, we maybe should be nice for a while. Uh, at any rate, in their spare time. The rockery was built by uh, shovel workers who didn't have anything to do. And uh, the rest of the buildings that we see, uh, most of them are quarried from stone right back in back of the Council on Aging, which apparently was a gigantic quarry at, at one time because a lot of buildings were built out of that. Most of the time, it was professionals that built those buildings. It was amateurs or uh, Irishmen who were used to building uh, crofts back in the old country out of stone that put this together, uh, which drove Olmsted crazy to the point where he said, don't tell anybody I had anything to do with this. It turns out that this is like the only one of these memorial cards he did, and he disowned it. But everybody thinks it's kind of cool. It gets overgrown really fast because Olmsted said, you know, if you're going to do this, you've got to have a gardener and water. Water was only put on, on this property about 20 years ago, uh, and um, we still don't have a gardener. It's maintained by the kindness of strangers. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a Friends Of group, there was the Garden Club. Right now, the Lions Club comes once a year and rakes it all out and makes it look as pretty as it can, but it needs, it needs work. And the idea was to have the vegetation grow up over it, symbolizing um, peace conquering war, war from the stones that look like a castle wall. And basically, if, if peace conquered war that well in the real world, we'd be a much happier place. But uh, there it is. It's the only one that he ever did. Down the hill. So this also is owned uh, by Dave Howe, who someday will turn this into a uh, uh, another store, maybe a restaurant, maybe a specialty market. It would be really cool. Uh, and it will work because there's going to be parking next door. So uh, this little space here that we're all used to when we come in with the, for the cleaners uh, will be expanded next door. And this is, uh, this is sort of a cheat. Uh, this is the E. William and Ellen Randall House and Market. Well, E. William Randall wouldn't have had this if he didn't marry uh, Ellen Talbert, whose daddy gave the land to build the house. Okay, and it was probably built a little bit before 1865, maybe even a lot before 1865. They got married in uh, 1860. So when you see these signs, God bless Frank Menino, uh, because there's not a lot of data to date houses, and you know, getting it as close as it is is really, really very good. Uh, so this has always been a commercial building. It's always been in every single picture of this area that's ever been taken because they didn't start taking pictures of, uh, of landscapes until about 1869 off the top of the roof over there. So this has always been there uh, and it's always been a market or a store down below and apartments up above, okay? Uh, e. William did really, really well from his start from daddy-in-law and ended up owning the next two commercial blocks down here that have been uh, developed over the years and they, they, the family did really well. Um, ultimately what happens here is that uh, tons of people um, who fit into our story, sort of, uh, had stores here. Marshall back in the uh, mid 1800s had a market and provision store uh, at, from 1903 to 1925, um, the Goward family had a market in here, um, and um, uh, it was also occupied um, in the, is there a wing still over here? Do we take that off? 
at any, oh, this area here, this wing here, was an express office, you know, like uh, UPS. It was Crummett's Express. Um, and if you were expressing nationwide, I don't know where it would go, but if you wanted somebody to throw something in a wagon and take it to Southeastern, here's where you'd come. Uh, and then um, um, between 1953 and 1968, uh, there were two drugstores here, Crane's Drugstore, which I don't remember, and Abbott's Drugstore. And Bob Abbott was a really nice guy uh, who had uh, two or three drugstores. There was one down where Wendy's is now, and there was this one, and then there was one in Braintree. So my family moved from Braintree, and we already knew Mr. Abbott uh, from over there, and it was nice to have this one here. We actually traded at the one where Wendy's was, because it was easier to park in those days. And then finally, a very first thing, this is the site of Easton's very first Chinese restaurant, okay? And it has a lasting impact because out on 138, there's a street called One Wong Way. And the Wong family was the one that uh, opened this restaurant. Freddie Gladstone lives out there now. Um, and then ultimately became the dry cleaners we're all familiar with. How many people remember the Chinese restaurant? Wasn't here for a very long time. Yeah, there we go. There's two of us, at least. And <laughs> Abbott's Pharmacy. Anybody remember the Abbott's? Boy. OK. This is a young crowd. <laughs> huh. So uh, I want to point out across the street, this is the one lasting uh, contribution of the Hans family to uh, Easton. My uh, grandfather worked for the phone company. And uh, his job in the, in the late 30s and early 40s was to come along and build the second generation telephone exchanges. Easton's first telephone exchange was down on Main Street. And do you think the town may be getting overdeveloped when hours and hours of these damn things go by every day? Just a thought. Yep. All right. So my grandfather uh, was putting in these new exchanges. The original exchange, Kay Healy, who was a teacher at the high school for a million years, when she was a kid, she was a telephone operator. And it was the best time to be a telephone operator. It was the time that you know he had to go like this and make the connections and then listen in. Uh, <laughs> So she said it was a great time to get all the gossip. Well, my grandfather came along and then putting in the first automated system. So from 1942 to 1958, when the new building was built over on the other side, the shapeless, amorphous, ugly little building, uh, the uh, phone company was here. And you can tell it was a phone company because the shutters have uh, uh, the Bell from Bell Telephone. And uh, we have to thank uh, Mr. Connolly, who had the insurance company here for many, many years. When it came time to redo those, he, uh, despite the fact that some of them were deteriorated, he had them restored so to, to keep those. He was very proud of that. Um, so that became the, uh, the new telephone exchange. My grandfather lived down on Prospect Street in a really nice colonial cottage. And my dad got married right around the time that his father was working in town. And sadly, my grandfather, who was a frugal Yankee, said, nah, you can't really afford the mortgage on this house, so I'm not going to sell it to you, blowing my only chance of becoming a real townie here in Easton. Okay. Now, after 1958, the cooperative bank, which was over in the White House and back, moved here. And it's one of those rare banks that has the honor of being robbed twice by the same guy. Okay. They caught him after the second time. So, uh, uh, and then subsequently it became Conley's, and now it's Altieri's um, insurance company. And if you if you haven't followed the story of um, uh, the um, I guess the, the barking, the dog that didn't bark in the night. Uh, Mr. Altieri put in a, a bench here for um, uh, the dog that was banned by the uh, lovely people in, at the farmer's daughter from sitting at the, at the World War I memorial. So 
we had a big ceremony and that's that was what's what's there so i do want to mention um the white house and back which uh is uh, now the barbershop and for many of us uh was uh, for a long time the the apartment building it was owned by Alf, Al alphonse carlson um who was the cemetery commissioner when i first started in town government and um, um it was owned originally by um Help me, God, here. Wait a second. Don't go away. Ah, John Tory. Uh, John Tory was a, uh, a local militia guy, and um, he got married to the, sis uh, the sister of uh, Evelina Gilmore Ames. And so if you read Evelina's diary, she's always visiting up here. Sadly, her sister had passed away in 1848. Uh, but if you're reading the diaries in the 1850s, she's coming up here to visit her two nieces, okay? And if you remember Mary Melvina Torrey, she'll figure back in our story in a while, okay? This is one of those interbreeding kind of a things, all right? So we're going to move down the street. We may actually cross over. Maybe we should cross over now. There's a sidewalk here. In theory, people will stop. So... Uh, when uh, we turn this over to, uh, to Doug King, we put some restrictions on it. The rotunda of the high school has to be preserved. And these windows that are staring out at us, they're called Palladian windows. They have to be preserved. Any, Doug can change pretty much anything else he wants to in there. Um, I'm not sure he ever got a really good investment out of there because the, the, in order to add additional apartments, he had to drill for months in order to lower the, um, the basement where we all had lunch back in the old days. Um, and subsequently, of course, we've lost this house. This is uh, this commercial building. This one uh, is new and that one is new. The one we're standing next to, however, is Spooner's um, factory. He was a tinsmith and stove maker and uh, along with Dr. Cogswell, who I've mentioned up, up above, uh, who was the, um, the doctor for the Ames family, uh, they developed this piece of real estate. Now imagine what this would look like. It's a really skinny little building. It used to be three stories tall. And the, the write-up for the Mass Historical says, yeah, it was three stories tall. We see pictures of it uh, from uh, uh, the 1880s three stories tall. No one in Easton 25 years ago when we, when we did this re ever remembers that there was a third story on here. So what happened to it is sort of a mystery. The second story lasted a lot longer uh, and um, people did remember that. Um, Spooner invested in having his factory here and then uh, the second floor was the home of the Cuisset Club which, to our knowledge, is the only um, men's club that ever existed in Easton. Uh, you know, there was the Grand Army of the Republic, et cetera, et cetera, and they actually met here, too. But uh, the Cuisa Club was a men's club, and it, basically it was a place where guys could go, sit in a big comfy chair, read the newspapers, and play pool, because it was a pool hall. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then the third floor, while it was here, apparently was the emergency home of the Grand Army of the Republic, which was originally down in Southeast, and that burned, they rebuilt, and while they were rebuilding, they had their meetings up here. Now, Spooner apparently took in uh, an apprentice named Kelly, and uh, Kelly figures in the story of the next building. But before we move on, um, I guess you guys wouldn't remember this one. I, said, I don't remember them either. But what happened was when we dropped down to two stories, then and eventually one, this became a lunchroom and soda fountain. It was run by a man named Swanson, who was a veteran of, of World War I. And um, I'm not sure we had a board of health in those days because people that did go there said, eh, it wasn't the cleanest lunchroom in the world. But it had ice cream. So it was attractive. Um, and then ultimately, for people that are my age, this became the Betty Jean shop. And the Betty Jean shop was super important because that's where you got all your OA stuff. 
Boys had to wear ties, and we had class ties. We had to get them here at the Betty Jean shop. Okay, so um, this was also the source of those wonderful Easton license plates that I fought so long to keep on the front of my car. Uh, so uh, it became a real thing, and now it's a, a yoga studio. Okay, I think it would do better as a yogurt studio, but um, <laughs> sadly, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. So let's move down the street here. It was the Quisa Club. Did I say that? Yeah, Quisa Club. No, I'm just making sure I didn't make the name up. If you like a better name, as Groucho once said, these are my principles. On these I stand. If you don't like them, I have others. So I could always make up another story. So this becomes um, the King Shoe Factory. And it was built by J.B. King, who came down from Maine. Uh, and put a factory in here. Uh, but uh, the real story here is that uh, eventually uh, it becomes um, Kelly's store. Kelly was a plumber and tinsmith. We believe he apprenticed over here and then moved over here with his business. And so for a long time, uh, he had his business right in there. And this didn't exist, OK? Uh, there was a stair to the second floor. Uh, because on the second floor was Kelly's Hall. Halls were very important in those days. Uh, the only other hall, which was a meeting place where any organization could just rent it out, uh, the only other hall was above Bill's Pizza. That was called Ripley's Hall, okay, and that was earlier. That, that building was built in 1859. This one is built in whatever it says on the sign. 1865. Uh, and. Um, for a long time, it was the shoe factory, and then in the 1880s, Kelly took it over and ran it uh, for many, many years. And then we all remember, I hope, that uh, uh, ultimately this becomes a hardware store, uh, Kyrie's Hardware Store. Uh, and then um, whether they owned it or not, let me double check. Uh, one of the things that we figure into the into the community here is that Pyres has, has bought up a lot of the real estate over the years. They're beginning to phase out and Dave House uh, owning more. Doug King owned a, a bunch of stuff on Main Street for a long time. But before the Pyres, there were the DeWitts. And the DeWitts uh, built the Grange Hall uh, in town and built many of the houses in this area, but they also invested in real estate. So they had a hand in one of these two buildings for quite a while into the t late 20th in 20th century. So uh, ultimately, what happens is that uh, uh, the hardware store was here, and they decided to put a movie theater upstairs. So Easton, yes, did have a movie theater. Um, and you can get an idea of how uh, lucrative that was, because the name of the, the owner, according to the young people, was Johnny Free Show. <laughs> and, and basically, if you didn't go up these stairs but snuck up the back stairs, you could get in for free. Okay, um, but we do have uh, several of the movie bills, and they did do, you know, not the movies that would be in, in the great big theaters in, in Brockton, but the the second time around for for those films. So it was pretty good, right here in Easton. Um, and then ultimately, this becomes the law offices of Kevin McIntyre. Um, so. Any questions so far? Have I made up a good story? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, go down to the next uh, next group of houses. So um, the houses in back here uh, are are complicated. There's the Gowards lived there, and other people lived there. Uh, the fella, the Goward that uh, had the slaughterhouse at uh, at Frothingham Park, that was his house there eventually. Um, but uh, there were seven Goward brothers. I'm not going to give you all seven Goward brothers' names. You don't need to know them. But what's special about this row here is that uh, in um, 1866, right at the end of the Civil War, Oliver Ames Jr., who is going to be spending a lot of his time trying to figure out how to build a railroad across the United States, decides to build a railroad from Northeastern to Taunton. And the way he does it is really clever. He has the old colony railroad buy up all these properties, most of which weren't here. There were a couple of houses um, 
here in the 1850s, but mostly it was empty space. So he buys up the lots, or has the railroad buy up the lots. Then the railroad, after, after they put the railroad through and not have to worry about anybody saying, oh, you're ruining my backyard, uh, they sell the land back to Oliver Ames, who then sells it to people who begin to build these houses. And the people that begin to build these houses are the upper middle class, okay? And ironically enough, uh, if we trace the ownership of these houses, and until the 20th century, there was one Swedish person who managed to move into this neighborhood. Everybody else was a Yankee, okay? Um, and uh, they were people like the overseer of the machine shop, and they were uh, people who, live, uh, who operated the Ames store, one of the Gowards. Didn't go into the slaughter business, he became the head clerk at the, at the Ames store over here. So uh, they all benefited. So this was an upper middle class neighborhood, which is why the houses are so cool. Uh, but the really fun house is right across the street, and this was one that actually was here uh, quite early on. Uh, it says, if it has a label on it, 1850s, but that's not really true. It's probably before that. Okay, it says probably built around 1850 by shovel maker Willard Lothrop. Willard Lothrop was a interesting character. It says here in the, in the research that he came from Maine, but the Lothrops were a, a big local family. Um, Oliver Ames Jr. married a Lothrop girl. They were cool. The Gilmores were not cool. In the Ames family, and they don't know why anymore, but in the Ames family, the Gilmores are the dirty Gilmores. And uh, the Lothrops have a much higher reputation. And Evelina, poor Evelina in, 18, in the 1850s, really kind of felt that. Um, her sister-in-law, Lothrop, uh, was the cool one. And poor Evelina was always struggling to be you know, not the country bumpkin. And the nadir of the, of the two-year diary that we have is when the uh, lady sewing circle didn't show up when they were supposed to be at, at her house. Nobody showed. Yeah, and we, yeah, it was mean. At any rate, Lothrop was a shovel worker, and uh, he was a shovel worker, and, and it, there's no indication he was like, Superman with shovels. He was just the guy that made shovels. Um, and he lived in this house. Uh, his daughter in 1850 married a guy named George Brett, more of which in a second. And um, he had uh, the, the sad problem in 1849, he lost his wife to, I think it was consumption. Um, so that was, there was a lot of illness going around at that time. Um, Mr. Um, great, why am I blanking on that name? Tory. Mr. Tory uh, lost his wife in 1848, and um, Mrs. Witherell, who was uh, Oliver Ames' daughter, the original Oliver Ames' daughter, lost her husband there. So if you read Evelina's diary, you'll see that Mr. Lothrop came to visit at the Ames house, and basically I have to read this quote. Willard Lothrop made quite a long call and told Mrs. Witherell that he did think at one time of coming to see her, but she looked so dignified, etc., uh, that he could hardly muster courage, etc., etc. So basically he showed up at this house to this widow lady who was basically taking care of her aging father uh, and said, hey, at one time I thought you were really cool and I was gonna ask you out, but luckily for Mrs. Witherell, he had gotten married. But the reason he came was that in 1850, he had started a spiritualist movement in town, okay? Now in Rochester, New York, there were these two uh, farm girls who believed, who told people they could contact the spirits and they had seances and there were all sorts of table wrappings and stuff like that. So that spread all across the country and good old Willard here and several other people in town became spiritualists, all right? Now ultimately what happened was that these girls in Rochester, New York, aren't you from New York? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so. A little further west. Though. Okay, all right. Then um, 
they were discovered and found out the table wrappings weren't, you know, weren't table wrappings. They were holding hands, but they were cracking their toes <laughs> to make the sound. All right. But before that was, uh, that happened, it spread all over the country. And he was holding seances in this building here. And we think that he came to invite um, Mrs. Witherell and the Ameses to a seance. Because the very next night, uh, the Ameses came, Mrs. Witherell was smart enough to stay home, and um, Mr., um, Mr. Tory came. So they had a seance in there, and we don't know whether anybody was contacted or not. We do have a record of another seance in time because some of the, he, he apparently was fairly dignified. One of the other seances, the person started off, oh, I'm in a trance and blah, 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 blah. And then very, very quickly it was like, and those terrible answers, argh, I'm a voice from the past. Argh, argh. <laughs> so it was a way for somebody to let off steam. Uh, they also met, uh, spiritualists also met in Ripley's Hall above Bill's Pizza. Uh, and by this time, George Brett was also here. Now, George Brett always claimed that he didn't have anything to do with the spiritualist stuff. But what he could do is he could hold your hand and tell you what's wrong with you. And then he could cure it. Okay. Now, it sounds like he, he was an early version of a chiropractor because he actually did cure people. Um, we did have some spiritualist doctors who had less success. Um, and, uh, but he apparently did manipulations, which is chiropractor stuff. And he started there and got huge, so big that he had to open an office in Stoughton and people came out on the train from Boston and all over the country to be taken care of by Mr. Brett. So that's that house. It's as close to a haunted house we get on this tour. So I tried, okay? So don't forget George Brett. In back of us here is uh, obviously what once was Copeland's funeral home, but uh, it started off as Willard Goward's house. Willard was the member of the family who didn't go into the slaughterhouse business, and he became the chief clerk at the Ames store, which apparently was a fairly lucrative business. Uh, ultimately, the um, place was uh, bought by George Copeland. Uh, the Copeland family had lived in town for a long time, um, mostly focused around uh, the area where Wendy's is today. Uh, there was Hiram and there was Josiah and an uh, interesting uh, daughter of the family. Um, and um, uh, ultimately, George Copeland came and then George Copeland II uh, was the last uh, owner here. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> So across, uh, across the street, uh, we have uh, the uh, Jason Howard House, okay? You may have heard it called the Admiral Wild House because he lived there for a long time. But uh, Jason Howard was the man who built the house. We always thought that... Uh, We always thought that the, uh, the, the house was built by uh, Admiral Wild, and the reason is as we move down the street and look on the corner there, there's a porthole window. Uh, but this house was built around 1870, and in 1868, Lieutenant, not Admiral Wild, married the daughter of, of Jason Howard. Now, Jason Howard's daughter was Imogene, which is a kind of a cool name. We don't have many Imogenes here in town. But her mother was George Brett's widowed mother who married Jason Howard, which was a smart move because George got to move into, or not into this house, but move into a family that was among the richest in town. After the Ameses, uh, uh, the family of Jason Howard from Elijah Howard, who was a partner of Oliver Ames, um, was really rich. So he grew up rich and then ended up as a spiritualist doctor, or maybe not a spiritualist doctor. And meanwhile, on the other side of the family, the, uh, the niece uh, grew up to marry a guy that was an admiral. And um, mostly we remember him as the man who took the most expensive ship in the American Navy and ran it aground. <laughs> um, 
but in reality he had a, a long and distinguished career. He uh, was at the Naval Academy during the Civil War and at that time Annapolis was actually located in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, and um, he graduated in time to see a little bit of service at the end of the war and then uh, stayed in the Navy for a long time. Non-war service in American has anybody seen she wore a yellow ribbon with John Wayne? And it was like, you know, yeah, of course you've seen it. Oh, you know, in five or six years, you might make corporal. Oh, oh, oh. Well, it was the same way in the Navy. Nobody, everything shrank down at the, after the Civil War, and there were not a lot of job openings for anybody. So it was slow moving up. But our Lieutenant Wilde did fairly well. And he actually got to take a, a, a brand new ship, a, a high tech ship. Uh, in the uh, early 1880s and sail it around the world as a, on a goodwill mission. So the Navy Department really trusted him. He also uh, spent some time with the Lighthouse Service inspecting lighthouses along the coast, which is ironic because if we went a little bit further up the street uh, to next to the old Baptist Church, there's 89 uh, Center Street. And if you look at it, the house looks like it has a lighthouse attached to it and that's because that guy was in the Coast Guard and when he stayed on land he built this house with a little lighthouse attached. Getting back to the general over here or the admiral over here during the Spanish-American War which was his one big chance to have a war he uh, served in the Philippines on the um, on the cruiser Boston captured um, uh, a town uh, in the Philippines and got a commendation from the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, and then he was switched over to the battleship Oregon, our number one ship, uh, and captured another city and rescued Spanish prisoners. Huh? Spanish-American War? Why is he? Well, after the Spanish-American War, good old imperialistic America decided we wanted to hold on to the Philippines. And the Philippines said, wait a second, you promised to support our independence. Well, yeah, 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 maybe 1945. Yeah. Um, and so there was an insurrection, and anybody who wasn't Filipino was in big trouble. So these Spanish guys who were left over from uh, the Spanish running of the Philippines were taken over by the insurgents, and we rescued them. Okay. And the Spanish government gave him accommodation. Well, then the next thing that happened was the Boxer Rebellion. Anybody know about the Boxer Rebellion? Okay. Yeah. So the Boxer Rebellion uh, was in China, absolutely, and the name comes from the fact that uh, it was an uprising of, of uh, peasants who may or may have supported the Dowager Empress. They were called Boxers because um, they knew Kung Fu. They didn't have a lot of guns, but they did have, you know, and then as they karate chopped people, they took their guns away and got to be quite a dangerous mission. So uh, in order to help out the international consortium that was trying to calm things down in China because we were stealing all their good stuff, um, our ship Oregon was sent there and cutting the corner to get to where he was going faster, uh, he ran the Oregon onto a rock that nobody knew was there, tore the bottom out of the place and the ship almost sank. It was considered a real feat for him to get it back afloat and get it to Japan before it sank. So everybody was kind of happy with that and they didn't kick him out of the Navy right away. But four years later, he retired and came back here to Northeastern uh, and um, lived happily ever after until his wife passed away and then he did. He um, was one of the very first commissioners of the Mass Maritime School. So uh, he was incredibly well respected. And Reverend Chaffin in his History of Easton says really nice things about him. You know, I mean, oh, he's a real hero, and he was. So he lived in that house. Yeah, I don't know why it hasn't been painted in 25 years. The original story was, hey, we're going to fix up the inside first. So, um, but it's one of these days. Who owns it now, Ed? Um, Connelly. Connelly. Connelly, yes. Not the Connelly Insurance, the Connelly Lawyer. Okay. Yes. Nice guy, Mike. Yes. Is the house empty or is it being used? It's, it's being used. There's people in there. Okay. And what about the house that the Petersons lived in that house that was built into the, the side of the little hill? And it was torn down when those condos were 
Yes, that's true. My Danny used to he was friends with the kids that lived there, and he used to love going there. Yeah, those were wonderful houses. We couldn't save them, and despite the fact that Doug didn't get a building permit for the, that thing for a long time, and they started to build it, and we made them stop, and it was a whole kid's house. But it's sad. Yeah, we've lost. Uh, overall, I, I'm doing a study right now of um, macros forms, which are the forms we use for the Mass Historical Society. And believe it or not, we haven't lost that many historic houses, but the ones we have lost have hurt. You know, so. Um, but. Is it difficult to get, let's say, for instance, any house that you've shown us? I don't see dates or anything like that? Yeah, all you have to do is apply. There's a, there's a fee. Uh, that's all? And that's, that's all. Yeah, if you have a house that was built in 2000 and you want to put a sign on it. No, no, I don't mean that. <laughs> no, but, but I, I do mean that because there have been a few people who have done that. Oh. Yep, just, just for chuckles. Where so. do you uh, at the Historical Society, yes. Now, right now, neither I nor Frank Menino is there, but we have an interim uh, curator. Uh, whose name is Ariel Nathanson, and uh, I'm sure she would have the forms, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a fairly quick process. Um, if it's a historic house, you look it up in Macris, and then you submit what you think is the date, and we say, hey, it's in Macris. It, you know. I always say, yeah, everybody who applies says the house was built in 1492, you know, Columbus. <laughs> And we had that incident. We had an incident with one of our directors. It was like, yeah, come in and take a look at my house. It's 17-something or other. And no, it wasn't. There was a little part of the shed that was a shed that might have been built in 1700. The rest of the place, we knew who built it. And she just said, well, the hell with it. We're not going to put a sign on it. So, um, but um, that's the Daniel A. Clark House. It's right on the intersection of uh, Summer Street and, and this street, whatever this street is. All right, we have to move along, otherwise uh, we won't get back to the end. This is the marathon part that's coming, the hill's coming, so. Is that, is that I didn't say that. <laughs> I love Pat, but she was so feisty. Yes, yes. we all love Pat. So this is uh, the porthole window that I, I mentioned. That was supposedly um, uh, Admiral Wilde's office, and that glass has been replaced. It has a little stained glass uh, insert in it, which is kind of cool. Um, I should point out that this is a relatively rare uh, mansard roof in Easton. Uh, it was very stylish to have a mansard roof until people discovered, wait a second, there's that many more seams on this roof? No wonder it leaks. Uh, so not many of them that... Um, the planet, but 1870s is about right. Um, it's um, uh, Second Empire style, and uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful house. It would be even more beautiful if it was um, painted in the style of the Victorian period with multiple colors. But um, uh, still, I I love this house. It was owned um, by Admiral Wilde when he passed away, and then um, Mary Shepherd owned it for a gazillion years. And when this family took over and said, yeah, you know, we're gonna work on the inside, um, that was probably true. The kitchen had a stove from 1917 yeah, in there. So uh, there was a lot of work to do. This also has a beautiful uh, garage uh, barn uh, in the same mansard roof style, which is kind of cool. So Oakland Ave um, was put in uh, I don't know what was on the corner here. This was a doctor's office, as you probably all know. Uh, and um, notice I skipped over the fact that I'd have to look up the name. Doctor, help Jacobs. me out. Dr. Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs. And Dr. Jacobs didn't live there initially. He lived in one of the houses across the street and then moved over here. He was, he was still here when I was growing up. Um, some of the kids that uh, were, played on the football teams and said he was a tough guy. Yeah, basically, you know, you came in with a broken leg and you gotta suck it up and I'll... <laughs> uh, but um, that's because he uh, served in, the, in World War II as a combat medic. So uh, he kind of knew what he was doing when it came time for emergency stuff. Uh, so um, this road came in, Oakland Avenue. Um, I don't know what the origin of the name is. It, 
Uh, I had a student for uh, many years ago who insisted that this house up here, which is uh, 6 Oakland Ave, was built by a guy that had been uh, to the gold rush. And this is where the name Oakland came from. But uh, that doesn't check out very well with the records. So let's, let's go up to the top of the hill. This is where it gets complicated with the family trees. So this is the uh, Ramoth Gilead Randall house. He lived from uh, 1820 to 1905, and he wasn't a wealthy man. I, I always thought that this was a fairly fancy house, but it's a typical New England box developed style with um, um, features to make it look like it fits into the later part of the 19th century, uh, the style of the windows and the, and the bulge out in the front. Um, gives it a lot of style. It's a really nice house. Uh, Randall lived in several other parts of town, and here's where it's complicated. He was the son of Ebenezer and Mahitable Phillips Randall which means nothing to you, but I have a friend who was trying to get his relatives into the DAR, and uh, they were the children of, of, a civil, of a Revolutionary War soldier, so I know that name very well. So he was the parents of them, excuse me, he was the son of them, Joel Randall, whose house used to be over where Unity Church is and now is in back of the World War II Memorial, uh, was another son. Joel Randall was the father of Ansel B. Randall, who was the last Easton boy to die in the Civil War. He was leading a brave charge and got shot in the head, on, like the last brave charge of the war. Okay. If you only knew when the war was going to end, you need to duck. And there were several poor guys in Easton, you know, oh, their enlistments are running out tomorrow. And he stood up and got shot. Well, this, this guy led a charge. Um, and then, not only did Ansel B. Randall lead a charge and die heroically, his commander, who was a Boston Brahmin, said, and you know, they wore out my horse. And that's all he said. He never made a comment about Ansel B. Yeah, yeah nice guy. Um, so there's Joel, there's Ramoth, and then there's Aunt Sylvia. Aunt Sylvia married a man named Samuel Strout from Maine, okay? And they lived just down the street on Center Street, a little bit past where we, where we came in. So three people, same family, all kind of lived in the neighborhood. And keep Aunt Sylvia in mind because we're gonna get back to her in a second, okay? So the Ramoth Randall house, um, was uh, really kind of a nice house. Um, nothing much happened after, um, after the, the family moved in. They stayed here for many, many years. Never had any children, which was sad, but they adopted a boy. And uh, Chaffin mentions the boy in his history, Robert C. Randall, which I think was incredibly uh, modest because uh, Mr. Randall here was the sexton of Unity Church for 30 years. Mr. Chaffin was the minister of that, and the middle name of the boy they adopted was Chaffin. And uh, our first historian didn't go out of his way to mention that. I should also mention down the street here, I, you gotta, you, you, I'm sorry I didn't point the house off. You gotta mention Heman Howard, Heman, or He-Man uh, Howard, who was the other historian between Chaffin and Hazel Varela. He was in the 40s. And his great claim to fame is he was on the school committee and two really incredible teachers, Kay Healy and Anna Craig, came in and said, you know, we noticed that we're not getting paid like the, the guys. And he said, well, little ladies, <clears throat> the guys are married and have families and you're not. And that's why we're not gonna pay you the same as the guys. Uh, and Anna got so mad she left town and never taught in Easton again. Luckily for us, Kay stayed and um, had a long, long career. But that was Heman Howard, a man of the old school. Uh, so we're going to move up the street now. So this house is, is, uh, was just purchased this year by um, a guy named uh, Joe Cherry and his partner who uh, moved in from 
Ohio, and they're fix, fixing the place up. It really looks beautiful, and um, it's Sanford Stout's Strout house. Sanford was the son of Samuel and Aunt Sylvie, who lived down the street. Sanford married Colonel Tory's daughter, Mary Melvina, who was the niece of Evelina Ames. When 1870 rolled around, there was this thing called carpet bagging. Okay, and so apparently Sanford went to uh, sort of Uncle uh, Oaks Ames and said, hey, could you get me a job? Now we know he had a strong contact with his family because when uh, Ansel B. Randall died, uh, you know, it was in the middle of the last part of the war, which is kind of chaotic. And uh, Congressman Ames worked really hard to recover the swords and the memorabilia and, and the body to get it back here to Easton. So um, there was a connection. And in this particular case, he got Sanford Strout a postmaster's job at Evergreen, Alabama. And uh, he went down there, brought his family, uh, and... Um, um, ultimately came back here in the 1890s uh, and is buried here in Easton. But um, uh, the family that made it as far as Evergreen, Alabama, produced children and grandchildren. And one of those grandchildren, my friend John Brimsfield, became the chaplain of West Point and uh, is the leading Strout genealogist. So uh, uh, the connections are, are, are multiple and very interesting. Josiah Goward, one of the seven Goward brothers, uh, ultimately bought this house. Goward and Lemuel K. Wilbur bought as many of the pieces of real estate in this, on this side of Center Street in Northeastern um, in the 1890s and actually plotted out the first subdivision in town uh, with uh, Columbus Ave and the two streets that follow after that and then these were just bits and pieces of things. We don't know whether he lived here or whether he used that as rental property. Wow, I think our streets need, need to be fixed. Uh, as I'm speaking, a chipmunk went into a hole, not in the, in the ground ground, but in our street. So we might want to step aside to give this car a chance to run over that chipmunk. So this is a, a duplex here that was uh, set up for uh, financial reasons. And the reason we're stopping here is uh, the house doesn't have a lot of style and the people have done a fantastic job of kind of sprucing it up and making it look pretty. Uh, but uh, it's a historic house because if you remember long, long ago when we started this tour, uh, I mentioned uh, Harry Pratt, the very first um, uh, sports coach in Easton's history. And he actually uh, rented this property when he got the job of being the uh, athletic guy up at, uh, up at the hall. And he stayed here a number of years and then moved down onto Center Street into a really interesting house because there are very few stucco houses in Easton and his house, which is right across from the church down below here, is stucco from the 1920s. He uh, ultimately left town because in 1917, Anna C. Ames died. He lost his, lost his salary, really, uh, and uh, left teaching and became a real estate person up in, closer to where he was born, up in Lowell. All right, I wanna point out this house because this is a fascinating house as well. It's a, it's a two, it's always been two. Yeah. So, this was really a dumb idea because, you know, let's double down on those mansard roofs and make one that's really big enough to take in, in the entire second story. This is a very unusual house in Easton, and it's a small house on a small lot, and it was done for a uh, shovel worker. Uh, his name was, let me take a quick look, just in case we have a relative. His name was... James J. Donovan, could it be my relative, I'm a Donovan. Um, and James uh, just basically worked at the shovel works. And in 1870, maybe early 1871, he uh, bought this land from the Ameses and uh, built this house or had this house built. And had this house built is what I think happened. Because earlier in the year, 
a man named Andrew Erickson built an almost identical house down on Andrew Street. Okay. Why is he important? Well, he is a carpenter who came from Sweden. To the best of our knowledge, Andrew Erickson is the first Swede to come to Easton to live. Okay. He got a mortgage from um, the Ameses, one year mortgage for $1,000, uh, built his house, worked at the shovel works, and I think he supplemented his income by building this house in a similar style to his own house. So it's like, oh, I really like your house. Could you build me one like that? Yeah. And this is one of only two or maybe three houses with this second floor mansard design in the entire town of Easton. So I think there's really a connection to the beginning of Swedes in, in Easton. Okay. What are you saying, mansard? Mansard, yes. Does it not sound like mansard? I'm out of here. Oh, I'll, uh, I'm really bad with articulation, so. <laughs> okay, let's not get run over. We've made it this far. We're almost done. In fact, we are sort of done. We're going to turn for home. Where is Andrew Street? Andrew Street is off of Mechanic Street, between Mechanics and Pond. Yep. All right. I'm happy I knew that. <laughs> Don't ask me any of the new streets. I want you to look up and down Barrow Street because remember we started off and talking about uh, the middle class and the shovel workers, et cetera, et cetera. When the shovel workers developed enough money to buy and build houses, there were people like the DeWitts who had come to town that would build today what we call track houses. And these houses along the street here, uh, for the most part, this one I think is a, a modern intrusion, were um, built for shovel workers who were buying their first home. And the same thing around the corner. So this is the neighborhood of shovel workers. Over there is a little bit more of an upper middle class neighborhood. But everybody was kind of all mixed together. And Mr. Blaisdell's son, Oliver, up here, ended up marrying a sister of Sanford Strout down here. So um, it was a close neighborhood. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you for staying awake. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well done, Edward. All right. Yeah. Thank you. We should do it again. Yeah, well, area. yeah, we'll do another area. Um, um, I like the idea of small walks. The last time I was in this neighborhood was 105 degrees, and we walked all the way down to Park Street and all the way back, and I lost half the people. So I, I saw a survivor yesterday. The Abates went on that trip, and they and they survived, but there weren't many. <laughs> so today was perfect weather, and uh, let's get you back up to the hill here.